All right, so kind of settled back in after the Ponies and the Smoky show. Um, that was kind of a grueling trip for me. Uh, I look at that more as work versus play, even though it was a lot of fun and I got to hang out with y'all. As you can see, I've kind of swapped positions on these vehicles. I told you that I was going to focus on the Goose for a little bit, finish up the last few little things that this twin turbo car needed. So uh, that's the plan. A couple things in this video that I'm going to kind of go over. Obviously, I want to go over what we're going to do on the Goose. What I'm going to do on the Goose. What you're going to watch me do on the Goose. Maybe do a Q&A. So I just put out a thing on Instagram. Uh, anybody had any questions that I f they felt like were pertinent questions that hadn't been answered on the channel in a long time that I felt like were good, which I haven't looked at them yet. If there are some good questions, going to do maybe a short Q&A, don't want to make it boring. And then the third thing that I want to do too that I haven't done in a long time on this channel is stickers. So I've got a full box of stickers. I'm going to try to get those on some equipment as fast as I possibly can for you new subscribers because it's been a long time. Um, I used to get everybody to send me stickers and then it would end up on the equipment. So everything I got in the shop has stickers on it. So let's do that. Questions already rolling in so there will be a Q&A. Stay tuned for that. And because I'm going to do this video a little bit different than what I normally do, we're going to run and gun. I'm going to kind of show you what's going on. Got some new little things that aren't necessarily updates, but something you haven't seen. So first, the first thing that you have not seen is the sheet metal wing on the goose. So this is not something necessarily that's going to stay. I didn't make this. This is a wing that I had on the goose back when I used to drag this, drag this. I used to drag race this thing kind of full time. Or I, I guess back when it was, when I considered it more of my drag car, uh, created the sheet metal wing for it. Kind of had it around the shop, found it in the attic, figured I'd break it back out, put it on the car, and just kind of see what your thoughts were. It's just aluminum. It's dirty. It needs to be cleaned up. I don't think I'm ever gonna run it again, but who knows. The way that I designed this thing is that I can like put it on, take it on and off uh, in place of the factory wing. So who knows? If I need it, slide it on there. Looks kind of like a lawn dart with it on there. And uh, when I don't need it, I take it off. I have uh, kind of been talking to some guys on Instagram that uh, are big in the Fox Body world. We're maybe talking about doing some kind of, uh, for fun, uh, grudge match racing at Mustang Week this year uh, on Thursday night, I think is what they're talking about doing. Some of the people you might know, um, Red Fox Coop, I think is his Instagram. He's got a twin turbo car, uh, Sick Fox, got a single turbo car that he just got finished up. Uh, anyway, several guys all mocked up. He's got a single turbo car. I think it's single. He just went... Bigger single or he went turbos? I think he went bigger singles. Anyway, a bunch of turbo cars may get together at Mustang Week. Just do some for fun, grudge racing. First thing, first update. The second thing, the Bibster. So I didn't really do a good video before we went to pits. I definitely didn't really show you none of this stuff um, because I was... So hard at work trying to get it finished up for pits. I mean, if you watch the pits video, you probably have seen it, but you probably didn't get a really good look at it. So I'm gonna do that. So basically I've had some questions on this. Basically it's just the arm that I made. It's still heimed down here at the bottom. A lot of people wondered how this was gonna stay. And all I did was I just put a inch and a half tube kicker in there. Um, Left-handed thread on one side, right-handed thread on the other side. So it's adjustable and I can kind of adjust the height of this of this. So a lot of people ask, you know, why is it heimed? What, what's the reasoning for that? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. And I explained this at pits. Obviously, if you weren't there, you don't know. So I'm going to tell you now. Uh, adjustability. One, that's the number one thing. So the back of it is heimed, uh, mainly to adjust caster and camber. So if I needed to move this out here in or out to adjust the camber, I can do that with the Himes here. I can adjust one in or out, or both, depending on what I need to do. That's gonna move this in or out. And so I have 
about that much camber adjustment. I'm also able to adjust caster by moving either both of them in or out. So like if I move both the himes in or out, this piece is gonna go forward or backwards and so I have a little bit of caster adjustment. Now, when I built this, when I designed it, I built it and designed it with the amount of caster and camber that I wanted, or at least that I thought I wanted, but it's always good to have a little bit of adjustment. And then with this section, I'm able to adjust the actual height of this. So as of right now, the plans, as of right now, are to continue to run this hydraulic cylinder with an accumulator which will act as a spring and so basically what you see is how it will be like it will ride down the road like you see it no springs no shocks the hydraulic cylinder and the accumulator will be the spring and the shock both in one that's the idea the only thing that i probably will change is i'll put a like 10 inch hydraulic cylinder on the front versus the eight inch that I've got. And the main reason for that is because right now the eight inch is fully out and you can't, can't ride down the road like that. You gotta have some, you know, you gotta have some droop and some compression, right? So I'll probably go with like a 10 inch uh, hydraulic cylinder, have this as, at, at right height and then it'll have like two inches of droop if I need it. Droop meaning like the tires can fall out if they need to. Some of the other stuff you probably haven't seen is the valve covers, those are just for mock-up the new lower intake. So that is the actual intake that I will be running on this thing. And then I just mocked up an upper that is very similar to what I want to do. So this is the throttle body that we'll be running. Um, the tube work will be very similar to this. This is the lower, like I said, and the intake itself, uh, I just threw this together in, it's like in basically cardboard just to give it, give everybody an idea of what I was envisioning at pits. Like if I just left it off, people wouldn't have a clue as to what I kind of envisioned on this. So what's gonna happen, I got a guy out of Florida, uh, JC, you'll hear more about him later on as we kind of get into this project, but he's going to do a billet lower section for the upper, all right? Then the top half of this will be all carbon fiber. So I'll make a mold here on the channel, actually hand lay the carbon fiber, we'll do some vacuum bagging, we'll do all of that. Like I'm gonna show everything. It's been a long time since I've done some carbon fiber. Most of you that follow me now probably never seen any of my carbon fiber videos, so we're gonna get back into that. And this whole entire top piece we made out of carbon. Some tubing, turbo, uh, got the water pump on there. Don't know if I'm actually gonna run the water pump up front like I have it now, or if I'll do like a remote style water pump. Um, it actually works where it's at, so I don't know, we'll see. And I already have it too, so. Well, I'll see, I guess, as, as this kind of goes along. Uh, turbo mount. So I kind of mounted this thing up. As you see it, four pits. But I think I'm going to make some changes. So right now, the turbo actually mounts to the chassis. I think what I'm going to do is get the turbo to mount to the engine. Um, don't know exactly how I'm going to do that yet, but probably do some kind of brackets on the cylinder heads themselves. Tubing will come off that that holds the turbo. And then you'll have the hot side. Obviously, it's attached to the headers. Um, couple reasons for this it would be nice to literally take loose the transmission mount and motor mounts and be able to slide the transmission uh, complete turbo system and engine out in one solid piece not take anything loose and then like slide it back and put it back in there if I need to uh, if it's mounted to the chassis then really the turbo system has to come apart before anything else can come out not that that's a huge issue but it just be easy other than that, let's see, what else? Change the tranny. So it has the T5 that I'm actually gonna run in this thing. So that's the actual T5 that will be running here with the shifter. Change the steering wheel. That's uh, probably the wheel I'll run. Um, I've actually got a wheel disconnect though that I may put on there and not exactly sure what I'm gonna do with the shaft yet. Uh, either get an aftermarket shaft or maybe clean this one up a little bit as far as some of these components um, i've actually painted it obviously you can see no more rust in here everything's all nice and clean and there's a drive shaft mocked up it's crazy because i didn't plan for it but a stock drive shaft out of a mustang basically fits this thing so even though i lengthened the wheelbase on it um somehow the rear end is the same distance from the transmission even though i moved the rear end up a little bit at least i thought i did what else? What else is something that you haven't seen? Oh, the entire chassis is cleared. So this is one of those things you can't really see as well on video as you can in person. But the entire tube chassis on this thing has been scuffed and cleared. 
And those that actually seen it in person at uh, Ponies in the Smokies can attest to or... I don't know if a test tube is the right word, but they can basically tell you that this thing shows in person, or at least in my opinion, this thing shows in person way better than it does on video, especially now that it's cleared. Um, you can't you can't get a feel for how slick these tubes look now. That everything's nice and clean and cleared. And how much it just looks like a new vehicle, the entire thing versus, you know, except for the body itself. I don't know. I wish everybody could travel to see it. I get that you can't. Maybe one day uh, I'll bring it across the country and let everybody see it. To the back, so everything back here, obviously everything's been finished, welded, cleared. And the rear end itself has been cleaned and painted. New cover with a uh, little accent. What else? What else do you guys need to know that I forgot to tell you or that I didn't film? How, how does this thing hold its weight? So for uh, Ponies in the Smokies, it's very important for me f for this thing to be able to hold its weight so I can kind of roll it inside, in and out of the building uh, and make it easier to get in and out of the trailer. And so basically this is, what, this is how it works. So on the rear, believe it or not, and this is gonna be crazy, especially for all those half inch bolt haters, the rear of this thing doesn't even weigh enough to compress the hydraulic cylinder, which is gonna be an issue for me because I gotta figure that out. But it's holding its weight right now with, uh, with no hydraulic system. The cylinder itself is so tight from the factory that uh, the weight of the chassis won't compress the cylinder even though there's no lines or anything on it. Basically articulating the suspension, try to get it to collapse, no go. So I gotta figure that out. Uh, I think when these cylinders are new, they're super tight. The front was the same way, and then after, you know, we kind of moved up and down, they loosened up a little bit, so I don't know what I'm gonna do. Probably put the fronts in the rear once they get loose, because I gotta put 10 inch ones up front anyways. So that's the plan for that. Then up front, what I did was I just put, and I don't know if you can be able to see this with this camera doesn't do very well in low light, but there are just uh, some air Schrader valves on the bottom of these hydraulic cylinders. And then what I would do is I would just, we had an air tank, we had an air compressor, and so before we moved this thing, so while I was at the show, we actually had it on blocks. We kept it on blocks in the trailer, and then before we'd pull it out of the trailer, before we put it back in the trailer, um, we just take the air compressor, fill this cylinder up with air, and then when I actually, you know, let it off the jack, remove the blocks, let it off the jack, the air itself would hold the front of this thing up. Um, it actually never leaked down, but I didn't really give it, you know, a crazy amount of time to leak down. We'd basically just kind of roll it to the trailer, get it in there, back on blocks, and then we'd strap it down to those blocks. But it worked. It got us, it got us going where we need to. Next thing for this that I'm gonna start working on is I gotta finish up some chassis pieces, add a couple more tubes, and then um, I gotta make flanges for all the tubes in this thing. I gotta make places for the sheet metal to attach to, so that's on the list, and then hydraulic setup too. So I'm gonna order a battery and start ordering all the hydraulic stuff in this thing. So long before it's drivable or running, I want it to be able to raise up and down uh, with, a, with a working hydraulic system. I wanna kinda test out the actuators, actuators, accumulators. I want to test out the accumulators, make sure those are going to work like I think they are. And uh, that's like priority number two on this. All right, so I think that's enough on the Bibster. So plans for the goose. I have a list of things I need to do for the goose. Some cosmetic, uh, some functional, you know, horsepower wise. Uh, horsepower functionality boost controller is gonna be one of the main things. Gonna try out the Innovate Motorsport boost controller to start with. So this is the kit that I've got for it. Uh, this is a pretty nice kit because it comes with a wide bando too. So it's gonna tell me uh, air fuel ratio on the gauge itself that can be read separately than the big stuff is reading. And this thing will also 
because it's a boost controller, I actually pull boost out of the car if it happens to go lean. So that's a plus. And then I can kind of dial it up or down based on what I need to do. It also comes with a map sensor. So I don't know, we'll see. I feel like this is a pretty good kit for what I'm doing. We'll see as it goes in and uh, some testing. Innovate's always made some pretty good stuff. I've used some of their stuff in the past. Didn't have any issues with it. Um, it's not really like a drag racing kit. You know, it's not like an adjustable where you can roll boost in or out. At least I don't think it is. Uh, but for what I'm doing, this will be this will be a good kit, I believe. So that's got to go in. Boost controller, exhaust. So I've got half of the exhaust already made. I got to finish that up. Um, that's pretty high on the list too because this thing's crazy loud and if I want to get out and test and kick around obviously I gotta have exhaust cosmetically so I ordered a brand new uh, cow piece even though I have one um, I really want to try to make this car as nice as I can without spending crazy amounts of money so I ordered a new cow piece I ordered all the new um, uh, tabs plastic tabs that the cow will mount to new screws uh, all new window track or window what do they call these things window window seals um, you can kind of see that this side doesn't look that bad but when you go over to this side it's all broke up and it's just old even the other side is really old it needs to be replaced not only the outside, but the inside as well. Um, I think I cut this one, this whole one out because it was just awful. So I ordered inside, outside, um, a new cow piece, all new weather stripping. So I'm gonna replace all the weather stripping in here. You know, when the door shut, I want this thing to shut like it's brand new. Um, new hatch stripping, weather stripping, um, everything via, via late model restoration. Oh, that's one thing too I didn't show you. So like when I designed this wing, it doesn't have any struts that attach to the bumper like you see a lot of times. It's just a self, uh, self braced wing. Obviously it's just cleek it on right, right now. But um, when I attach it, I just rivet. I rivet it all the way across the top and then when I want to take it off, I just drill the rivets out. So anyway, it's cool it holds itself and then to get in the get in the back you don't have to undo anything so the back so the back needs the plastics back in here i need to put the headliner in this thing which i still have um carpet i actually have the carpet piece actually it's not carpet but it's a piece that i actually made that fits in the back of this thing um it's got some kind of felt on it but it looks pretty good so that'll probably go back in here too and then just carpet all the way down where the back seats used to be and I do have to do some tube work in this thing. So used to, I had tubes from the roll cage attached to the upper torque boxes. Um, and you can still see the tubes in there. So I'm gonna have to cut those off and actually run new tubes up to the existing cage. Just kind of strengthen that. And then inside the car, I still got to put the speaker grills back in. I got to get those trimmed up to fit around the roll bar itself. So I'll get that done. I'm going to make a bezel piece that kind of goes around these switches. So right now you just kind of see the, the dash piece. And I'm going to make actually a bezel that goes in there that kind of fits around these buttons. And I'm going to make a bezel piece for where the radio goes right here. And then this piece that feels around the shifter. Um, I think I'm going to actually put the fuel gauge and stuff up here. I've got a gauge that reads fuel level level in the tank, so that's got to go in. Other than that, that's pretty much it. Like I said, the headliner's got to go in. Get all that stuff kind of tidied up. i got to make a latch to hold the glove box shut. But once all that stuff's done, this thing should be pretty slick on the inside. It should look pretty clean. All right, so there you go, updates. Like I said, this video is way different than what I normally do. But sometimes sometimes you need this. Sometimes I need this. Uh, new tent, too. We're going to retent the whole thing. If you watched the, uh, if you were at uh, Ponies in the Smokies or you watched the video, 
Um, my buddy Chuck was there. He's the one that had the uh, very low mile 93 Cobra. Uh, me and him have been friends for ever since high school. We've been friends for a long time. And um, we don't hang out as much as we probably should. But I think that's going to change. He's got a bunch of cars. He's got a race car that we're probably going to do a turbo setup on. I'm probably going to have on the channel. He just built a big shop. So uh, I think we're going to hang out, try to hang out a lot more on the channel, do a lot more stuff. So you'll kind of see him uh, more often. But anyway, he, um, that's what he does for a living. Owns a tent company. So we're going to get this thing tinted. Uh, all new tint on the windows and maybe even do, maybe even do the windshield to give it that sinister look. All right, so if you're still hanging around, you're not bored, haven't run you off, let's do stickers really fast. I'll get through those and then we'll do Q&A. All right, let's see what we got here. Oh, some Ray Bestis. So I didn't tell you guys, but um, a while back on the channel, I basically reached out and said, hey, if anybody has any um, Fox Bite calipers that uh, they'd be willing to send me, let me know. Ray Bestis hit me up, said, hey, we got what you need. We're gonna send it to you. New calipers, new pads, new brake lines. And so I've got all that stuff. And uh, you'll see it on the channel very soon as we put that stuff on the Bibster. Hoppos, all the uh, hydraulic suspension coming from Hoppos, or most of it at least. Built to beat. So I met these guys in SEMO, which basically tells you how slack I am because it has been what, November, so it's been like four or five months, but I met these guys there, they gave me a sticker, and I've since followed them on Instagram, so you can go check them out, Built to Beat. Uh, it's a cool name, cool sticker, cool guys. ZT Fab, uh, for you guys that have been around for a little while, you know who ZT Fab is, they're the ones that done my, they're the ones that made my amazing welding cart that I've got. Uh, did some cool videos on that. All right, let's get into the mail, so I've got Plenty of mail that I've neglected to open. How many LZ fans in the house? All right, so DACA disc. Man, this has been a long time. This was probably like middle of last year when they sent me these. I totally forgot about them. They're in the box. My bad, guys. Anyway, DACA disc, DOCA disc. Sent me all these uh, Ziz Wheel disc, or at least I call them a Ziz Wheel. Love these things. Use them all the time. Go check them out. Is that Dallas Fort Worth? Is that what that is? DFW Minis. I guess if I read the note, it would tell me. Yeah, Dallas Fort Worth area. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate the sticker. All right. Thanks, Frank. Appreciate the support. Car Action Magazine, Kansas City. These guys have actually sent me a shirt, I think. When, when are you gonna feature the Bibster? Shout out to the YouTube channel. Thanks, Craig. Bulldog Welding. Appreciate it, Aaron. 73 El Camino. Right on, Jacob. Power Stroke Customs. Appreciate the letter, as always. All right, Landon. Appreciate the letter. For me. And some more 95 Fury sticker. Chaos Garage. Another YouTube channel. Appreciate it, Rob. Turbo Performance LTD. Based in the UK. So if you're looking for a UK Turbo Specialist Turbo Performance LTD, go check them out. can't ever have too many bottle openers. I mean, sorry it's been so long. I've been really slack. Um, a lot of you guys that sent me this stuff probably like, man, he ain't never gonna open it or he's never gonna have it on the channel or I got robbed. I really like this stuff. I love the letters. I'm actually thinking about having a whole wall in the new shop where we're just gonna like plaster all the letters you guys send. So anyway, if you're interested in sending something, there's an address I think in the description. You can send me some stickers. I'll try not to be so slack next time. You can see some of the ones I've already got. Both sides on this bad boy. And I've already started filling this one up. 
Anyway, even though I've been slack, if you guys keep sending me stickers, I'll try to keep getting them on equipment. You send me a sticker, I guarantee you'll be on a piece of equipment in the shop. I may not guarantee the timeliness of that. All right, because I feel like this video is gonna be super long, which I never know until I go to edit them, how long they're actually gonna be. Uh, gonna try to make this Q&A as fast as possible. If you sent me some on Instagram, I'll try to get to it. Let's see how fast I can answer these questions. Uh, what do you do before YouTube? What made you wanna do YouTube? And is YouTube your only income? This is from Brian Gabriel. So this is the deal, YouTube, I've kind of talked about, about this in other videos, um, but it's been a long time, so I'll kind of go through the whole thing again. And then, as I mentioned in the last video, the very end, if you didn't hang around, you missed it. Uh, if you didn't hang around, you also missed a ride in the goose, but that's here nor there. I'm gonna start going into the business of YouTube a lot more. Now, I may not go into like metrics and money and that sort of thing, but uh, I'm gonna go in more into like the brand deals and how I like look at YouTube as a business, like how I treat it like a business, what that means to me, um, how I schedule things. Um, yeah, all of that. So you guys can kind of see that. Uh, I think YouTubers in general uh, get a lot of flack for some of the brand deals and, and maybe because they can make a living making videos. And I don't want to run from that. I don't want to be ashamed of that. I'm very proud of what I've done. I've worked extremely hard to get to where I'm at. And so I'm just gonna bring you guys into it versus run from it and act like it doesn't happen. Uh, YouTube's a hard business to be in. I mean, it seems easy because some guys, it probably is easy, like they start a channel and then in a year they got a million subs, right? And they're making money and they're doing it full time. Most people don't do that though. That's not how it usually works. For me, specifically, I started in 2010. Um, I probably worked on it for uh, four or five years didn't make anything, nothing. Made these videos just to show people what I was doing, show people that things that I was doing could be done, and try to encourage people to do things that they felt like uh, couldn't be done, or to try things that they felt like couldn't be done. So I mean, I did, I put in four or five years, a bunch of videos, before I actually looked at it like a business and decided that I was gonna go all in and spend a ton of time to try to make content for you guys. Ultimately, what it comes down to for me is making content for you guys. I mean, um, even if I didn't make any money doing this, I'd probably still do it. Now, where the money part comes in that's really good is that it allows me to maybe do bigger projects, right? So, uh, if, you know, if I didn't make a living on YouTube, the projects maybe like me making a sign or me, you know, making. Uh, some brass knuckles out of big lug nuts or you know some stuff that you saw me do in the past They weren't really big projects or little projects. I'd kind of throw something together put it on YouTube and that would probably continue for the most part I mean, I'd probably be working on the goose and doing odds and ends, but You know to, to create the kind of content that I'm trying to create on YouTube. It costs a ton of money so You know really I'm just reinvesting back into the business it ain't like I'm balling out here. I do have the ability to maybe buy more expensive parts and you know, kind of throw money at projects that I've always dreamed about doing, so that's a plus for me. But, I mean, really, it's just so I can create content for you guys to enjoy. It's kind of like a full circle thing. That was a really long answer. If I'm gonna get through this stuff fast, I gotta stop doing super long answers. So, let me finish that though, I didn't even finish. So this is the deal. I got into YouTube back in 2010. I made a carbon fiber intake for another car that I had at the time. Um, a lot of people that are, were around me basically said that it couldn't be done. And so I was like, you know what, I'm gonna film this, put it on YouTube and then, cause I'm sure a lot of other people feel like it's probably something that can't be done either. And long story short, just like everything else that people tell me I can't do, it works out perfect and whatever. Before I got into YouTube, I was in the corporate world. If you see some of my early videos, you actually notice that I'm wearing like, uh, you know, like polo shirts and stuff, and that's because that's what I was doing for a living. I was actually managing some medical equipment companies. I was Mr. Corporate, dressed up every day, meetings, all the BS stuff that I didn't really want to do, managing tons of people. Um, 
apparently I was pretty good at it because they kept promoting me, but it wasn't my thing. Like being creative is my thing. Making videos, being creative, making videos, being creative, making projects. That's my thing. That's what I love to do. It's my passion. And so it just kind of worked out for me. All right. Brian also asked another question. Brian, you got a twofer on this Q and A. Am I going to sell this property? As some of you guys know, we're building a house. I'm going to build a new shop. Um, the land that we're building that on is some of Heather's family land. So it's kind of sentimental to her and her family. Uh, we will not keep this place. We talked about maybe renting it. We talked about maybe doing some Airbnb. Uh, but ultimately, we'll probably just sell it. So I can buy more parts. Uh, one question I get all the time, too, that Brian also asked. And Brian, this is it. You got more than a twofer. Is how did I get how did I get started? How old was that when I started doing fabrication? So kind of I want to try to answer this question because it's a question I get all the time. When did you start? How did you get started? What kind of training did you have? What kind of schooling did you have? And all those are basically none. So uh, I started when I was super little. Like I've always loved to build and create. I remember as a kid, my dad would, uh, he was in construction. He'd basically just put me on a big pile of wood with a hammer and some nails and I would just make stuff all day long. That was my thing. Like I love to make things. So from just a wee man, I've been making things. Uh, I remember as like a early teen, I was building go-karts. My uncle had a welder, an old stick welder that he let me use, and I was just taking any kind of scrap metal that I could find and making something out of it. So that's kind of how it started. Uh, from there on, no formal education, no trade school education, no internships, nothing. Like I was just one of those that I was like, I'm going to figure out how to do that. And I'd save up every penny I had and I'd go buy a welder and then I'd learn how to weld. Or, you know, I, I guess I did learn some stuff via osmosis. So I've got friends that are in, like build chassis, race car chassis. Um, I've learned a lot of things from them just by watching, not necessarily through them teaching me. Um, having this channel and, and visiting other fabricators, I pick up on little things that they do. Uh, going up to Jeb's place, I pick up on a lot of stuff that he's done. Uh, so I guess in a way he taught me, but not officially, if that makes sense. All right, let's see. I'm going to try to read through some more of these. Are you going to run the Bibster to see what kind of times it will run? Or is it strictly a show car? Uh, yes, I'm going to run the Bibster, I'm sure. I mean, how could you not? Like, I'm sure that thing will end up at the track. What it runs, though, is not that big of a concern to me. If it does, if it goes 1250s or 950s, I don't really care. It doesn't matter. Not just a show car, though. So the other question, part of the other question was, or is it strictly a show car? Not just a show car. Obviously, I love the wow factor of this. I feel like it's going to bring some attention to the channel, which is always a good thing. But that kind of build has always been something I've been interested in doing ever since I was in school. I remember like sitting in uh, class, and instead of paying attention to the teacher doing what I was supposed to be doing, I was drawing the car that I was going to build from scratch. And so, I mean, it wasn't exactly like that, but... I've always been interested in doing something like that. And to be honest with you, now that I've started this build, it's going to be hard for me to go back to anything else. Uh, if I do go back to another C10 build or another Mustang build or a truck build, whatever it is I go back to, I don't see it being like the goose where it's just little fabrication and a lot of bolt-on. Um, I, th I think everything I do from now on is going to be crazy wow, right? So even if it's a C10, like, It'll be a back half C10 that's you know an air ride or whatever or I want to do like a trophy truck build so that'll give me the opportunity to basically build the chassis that I want hang the body on it rock and roll what is the lowdown on the goose the goose was my very first car I bought that car when I was 15 so that's why even though it's not the nicest car um, it's not the most wanted car like I guess the most popular Fox body is a, probably a coupe I actually like the coupes more than the hatchbacks. The reason I still have that car though is because it's my first car and I'll probably never sell it. Combination on the Goose, the chassis that I put in it is basically a 25 to five. I left out a couple bars just because I don't want to be climbing around the funny car part. But if I ever wanted to upgrade to that kind of chassis, I add those coat bars, I'm good. I can get it certified. The car is still stock suspension. Stock suspension, it's not ladder bar or anything. Um, I like that idea. It has been mini tub slightly factory 
what I call factory mini tub. I just moved the factory mini tubs in a little bit, narrowed the rear end a little bit. Um, still running like factory springs and all that stuff in the rear. Um, I kind of cut some buckets in the frame rail to kind of tuck those springs in for tire clearance. Mainly did all that because I wanted to take like a 10 inch wheel combination that you'd normally see on a Fox body. And instead of, instead of having it way out there on the lip, I wanted to tuck it a little bit. So I wanted it to look like you was running like an eight inch wheel package, but have a 10 inch wheel package in there, I guess. I don't know if it's like a little cognito or just for looks, but that's why I did it. Not so much because I wanted to run some huge tire. Up front, obviously everything's tubular up front. Uh, Jag, uh, AFCO stuff in the rear. Um, Coney adjustables up front. The engine combination is a Dart 351 based, 400 cubic inch, all good internals, all good stuff. I think the block will hold, I don't know, 2,500 horsepower or something. Uh, Big Stuff 3 controls the fuel and the spark. Crank trigger, twin 70 millimeter turbos. The turbos will do like eight, 850 a piece. So I guess in a perfect scenario, the car will make 1,700 horsepower. I mean, it won't, but something like that based on what the turbos can make. Custom grind um, Bennett, camshaft in it, hydraulic roller because I want it to be a street car for all you street car haters. It's hydraulic roller. I mean, that's, that's like grocery store camshaft. And then everything else on the car is custom fabricated by myself. The entire turbo setup, it's just got uh, basic shorty headers turned around backwards that are stainless. Uh, two and a half inch stainless stuff going to the headers. Everything under the frame rail so you don't see none of the hot side. And then almost all of the uh, cool side is hidden as well. So it goes down under the car through a air to air intercooler up front. Up through the fender so you don't see any of that, thing, any of that stuff. Goes through the cab and then comes out at the firewall where you see it. You don't see any of it inside either. That was the idea is I wanted this engine bay to be as clean as I possibly could get it. And I want tubing and stuff everywhere. When you raise the hood, I wanted an engine, two turbos, and that's it. And so I think I got pretty close to that. All right, let's see what else we got. Thoughts on the new GT500. From the very little tiny pictures that I've kind of seen released on the front of that thing, I think it's going to be nuts if that's what you're talking about. If you're talking about the one that's out now, they're all right. They're heavy. But the new ones, they look like they're going to be pretty sick. If Ford can lighten them up, more horsepower, I'm all for it. Man, all I see is beer. Do you ever take shots? Mm, no. Not really. Anyway, I haven't, took a, I haven't took a shot in a long time. But, what's my drink? I do like to mix a drink every once in a while. In my, in my drinking cup. Here's one from Boosted Brothers Customs. I'm assuming they're in Australia because... The question starts out with, good day, mate. Any advice on how to import a Fox body in Australia and what to look for body-wise, as in rust, signs of fixed up damage, etc. cetera. Uh, we're looking to import one and build it for our YouTube channel and are going to put an engine in it, I believe. Uh, oh, so they're gonna put an engine in it that they don't believe anybody else has done, which would be very cool. If you do that, I wanna see it. Hit me up, tag me, Boosted Brothers Customs. This is what I can tell you. I have no idea how to import one into Australia. No clue. Uh, some of the failure points on the Mustangs are the upper torque boxes. A lot of times those get ripped out. It's a really easy fix. Other than that, they're pretty durable vehicles. I mean, they don't have really big issues with rust that I know of. Now I am in the south, I'm not up north, but um, it's not like some of the older ones where the pans were just uh, awful for rusting out. So I don't know, they're great cars. They're from the factory to me, they're, they're a great car, especially if you wanna like go fast. And uh, I'd love to see an engine in one that I haven't seen before. I mean, I've seen obviously every variation of Ford engine. I've seen umpteen million LS setups. I've seen a couple 2JZ swaps in the Fox body. So other than that, I'd like to see, oh, I've seen a, a diesel, I think. 12 valve maybe, anyway. I'd love to see something different. Hit me up. Do you prefer turbos or superchargers? Turbos, one trillion percent. 
Not that superchargers aren't good, they're amazing. And as a matter of fact, some of my racing buddies from back in the day that used to run some of the classes where you could run power adders um, actually said that it was easier to get on the track with a, a, a supercharger setup versus a turbo setup because I guess the power was more linear and you could kind of, it was easier to tune. But I think you can make more power on a turbo versus supercharger, um, you know, especially in some of the classes that are set up. And me personally, I just love a turbo setup. I mean, I built, so I was a nitrous guy back in the day when I was younger, as a lot of people are, just because it's the cheaper, the cheaper thing to do. Uh, built my first turbo setup on a single turbo coupe build. Uh, I actually did a video on this channel way back when. I think it was like the third video I posted, or maybe the second video I posted. And it's not really a video of how I built it because I'd actually already built the car before I did the channel. So I just took some photos of the build and kind of made like a, you know, you've seen them before. Really cool car called Plain Jane from the outside. Looked totally stock, stock hood. You open the doors, no gauges, no nothing on the inside. It just looked plain Jane. Uh, single 70 on it, stock bottom end. And I think the thing, I ended up selling it. The guy that got it for me uh, actually put it on the dyno, and I think it made 550 to the tires or something. I had it made three passes in the car um, and went seven flat. Only made one good pass, went seven flat in the eighth. Uh, the car did really, really well, and it was super fun to drive on the street. I mean, it was nuts. You know, it didn't matter how, you'd be running 60 on just a stock radial, and I mean, she'd want to change lanes on you. So ever since then, I was sold. I'm like, Never do anything else. Twins on this one, single on the Bibster. May do a single turbo setup in the Tahoe. Um, trying to convince all my friends to go turbo, so I'm definitely a turbo fan. I have experience with superchargers, more of the street versions like the S-Trims, T-Trim. I had a car back in the day that had a F, a Pro Charger F-Trim on it. I think it's called F-Trim. Big, big bad boy. I mean, it was a monster. But when I got it, I just seen dollar signs. I was like, man, I could sell that turbo. I mean, that supercharger, it almost paid for the car. So that's what I did. C Wright 247, would you ever take an apprentice? Absolutely. So this is how I feel about doing like apprenticeships. Uh, it's starting to rain. This is how I feel about apprenticeships and, and just help in general, because I get tons and tons and tons of people that hit me up and say, hey, I want to come help. I want to come hang out in the shop. I'd love to come learn from you. And you know, and a lot of times I'll respond like, are you local? No, nah, I live in Idaho. And I'm like, you're going to like relocate? I don't, I don't get it. This is my thing with apprenticeships or, or, you know, doing something like that. If, if you're talking the talk, you better be willing to walk the walk, right? So, I mean, you better be 100% dedicated to what you are telling whoever it is that you're trying to get an apprenticeship with that you're gonna do. If that's me, if you hit me up and you don't live in South Carolina or you don't live up the road, you better be willing to relocate, get your own place here, and maybe even get another job to afford to live here while you come work with me. Uh, one of the things I'm gonna do in the new shop is obviously, um, you know, in here, it's just me piddling around, you hanging out, and we make stuff. The new shop is going to be more of a business, a fabrication style business. That's how I'm going to set it up. I mean, I plan to be very selective on what kind of customers I take. I mean, I don't have to, I don't have to have customers to make a living. So I have the ability to be very selective on what kind of projects I want to take. And those are going to be projects that I'm interested in. I'm not going to be doing work that somebody else wants. You know, they want it their way. It's going to be stuff that people want. Something that I am building my way and they just want it. Perfect customer, that's the kind of customer I want, and so I'll need some help for that. The other thing is too is we're gonna start selling some other things on Kill Fab uh, other than clothing. So I got some ideas of things I wanna do going forward. Hopefully I can do that within my new shop and I'll need somebody to help. This is my thing though. If you want an apprenticeship, you're basically asking somebody to come, you're asking somebody to teach you everything they know about the business, okay? Uh, and you're asking them to do it basically for free. But nothing's for free in this world. Here's the deal, this is what I think about apprenticeships though. 
I think they're an amazing way to learn what it is that you want to learn. So if you want to do fabrication, you want to build hot rods, you want to build drag cars, you want to build motorcycles, whatever it is that you really are passionate about and you want to learn, I think it's the best way to get you where you need to be. Uh, I have a lot of people ask me about trade schools. I think trade schools are awesome. They're going to teach you the trade. They're going to teach you those skills to, to make those things, to use those tools. But they're not going to really teach you how to acquire customers and keep customers and do customer customer and business things, right? They're just going to teach you the trade. And in fabrication, when you're building custom things, really the hardest thing is to acquire those customers, to keep those customers, to build a brand, to do a lot of things other than just weld and cut and, and fabricate. So, you know, when you go do an apprentice, you're going to learn all those things. You're going to see the guy that you're working for. You're going to see how he interacts with customers. You're going to see how he keeps customers happy. You're going to see how he acquires those customers. I mean, this business, in, in, for the most part, is word of mouth business. So anyway, long story short, apprenticeship's the awesomest way to do it. But listen, you're going to have to pay your dues. You're going to have to go in there. You're going to have to sweep the floors. You're going to have to do all those things that really suck. And you're not going to be able to do the cool things for a while. That's how you're paying that person to teach them what it is they know. Hope that makes sense. And that's basically what I'm going to do. If somebody wants to come work with me, fine. But it's not going to be like no glorious do donuts in the parking lot, build crazy hot rods right from the get. Be on YouTube right from the get. Or you might be on YouTube, but you'll be on YouTube sweeping the floors. All right, last question. How long did it take you to figure out the suspension on the Bibster? Was there something that you wanted to do but couldn't figure it out or because of cost didn't? Uh, I've been working on that thing, what, five or six months? That's about how long it took me to figure out the suspension and to be honest with you, still not figured out. I won't, uh, I won't classify that suspension as figured out until she's going down the road, no issues. Um, as far as cost goes, I don't really sacrifice anything in cost. Uh, obviously, most of stuff I do is not store-bought anyway and so you know, I just buy the best Himes or joints or that sort of thing that I can find tubing and then I just make the rest of it so No and yes or yes. Yes or no. Anyway, that's it For this version of Q&A. It's been a long time. I hope that answered a lot of your questions I hope that kind of gave you some background into some stuff. That maybe you didn't see because it's been a long time um, Like I said kind of a different video, but hope you enjoyed it as always, thank you for joining me. I'll see you guys some more next week. Gonna get back on the Friday videos, back on the welding videos. Gonna fire up some new business videos and then obviously we're gonna be working on these. So until then, go do work, son.